I want to encourage you today. You are standing in this very moment at the time which God has assigned and appointed for your life to change and never be the same again. People fear change sometimes because they get comfortable and familiar. Now, I understand, you know, I understand familiarity. I understand comfortableness. I understand wanting to feel secure. But let me tell you, in the things of God and in the ways of God, you cannot afford to grow comfortable and to grow stale and to grow relaxed. You must embrace the seasons of transition and the seasons of change. Otherwise, you won't see the miracle working power of God in your life. He alone is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Joy in abundance. He promised you financial prosperity aspect of your life. If you need to see his own today, and God has treasures for you that he has not hidden from you, but he has hidden for you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, right now, They'll criticize you and say you don't love it. Your best days are straight ahead of you. Because you feel the Holy Ghost in this place. And accelerate me right to the top. Reach up there and pull it down. Hallelujah. I grew up. And, and, and thought I was saved all my life. You know, a lot of people say, well, I've been serving God since I was a little kid. You know, I was the same way. Thought because I grew up in a Christian home serving, uh, that they served God. Well, I'm just a believer too. And, and I was up to the age of accountability where I had to determine for myself that I was going to serve God. And I remember when that day came, I was nine years old. Hadn't committed a sin against God that I knew of. But at nine years old, that realization set in that, you know, if I was really born a sinner, then that means I have sinned against God. And that day at nine years old, in a summer church camp in Hartford City, Indiana, I stood there and I gave my life to Jesus. I remember the time, remember the place, and remember who was standing around me helping me pray. And that changed my life forever. When you were filled with the Holy Ghost, like our brother this morning, he ain't never gonna forget this morning. His life has been changed forever. He will never be the same. Hallelujah. The days that you were married, the day that you were married. Let's pray it's not days, plural. The day that a close loved one passed away, a job change, a big move, a purchase of a house, the birth of a child, those days of tragic events or happy occasions. In those moments, your life was altered forever. And from that moment on, everything in your life changed, things would never be the same again. You had a shift. Somebody say shift. You had a transition. Somebody say transition. And you'll never be the same again. I want to share with you at least two transitions that have occurred in my and my wife's life. And I'm talking about besides getting married and having kids and all that kind of stuff. I sat down last night and I said, God, I need two transitions. Actually, there was one I was already thinking of. But I, then I realized that the transition I was going to share with you today would not have even been possible without the first transition happening. The biggest transition that has occurred in our lives, and I asked her as, as we were coming in this morning what she would think the biggest transition of our lives was. And she said the very same thing that I did. The biggest transition occurred in our lives when we came into contact with a true man of God. Not a preacher, not a pastor, not a self-proclaimed prophet who prophesies and doesn't prophesy, but a true man of God. And you would say, well, that doesn't seem like a very significant thing. Well, it ought to be to you. Think about the Shunammite woman who thought so much of the man of God that she decided, she and her husband, to build a chamber on the side of their house for which he and Gehazi could dwell when they passed by that way. He came and laid down in that bedroom one time and then he gave her a word that forever changed her future. A promise of a son. And the next year that son was born. And a few years later, while he was working out in the field with daddy, the son died. What did the woman do? 
she took the son in her lap. She carried him upstairs to the bed of the man of God and she laid them not on his bed in his bedroom, not on the boy's bed, not on her bed. She laid him on the man of God's bed and then she saddled up the donkeys in the wagon and she took off to find the man of God. There was something that changed in her and her husband's life when they came into contact with a true man of God. Nothing stayed the same. Nothing. Think about the woman who had sons who were about to be sold into slavery to pay a debt that her deceased husband left behind. And along comes a man of God that gives her one word that she had the choice to obey or to disobey. And if she had disobeyed, her sons would have been sold into slavery. But she counted it so valuable, the word of that man of God, that when she obeyed, there was the miracle multiplication of oil pouring again and again and again till there was enough to sell and pay off their debt and more to live on even after that. Think about the woman who had a son and they were in famine and they had just enough meal left to bake a little pancake. They were gonna cut that pancake in half. She's gonna eat half and he's gonna eat half and then they're gonna lay down and they're gonna die in their starvation. But along came a man of God who spoke a word and instead of disobeying or turning it aside or disregarding it, instead of letting it pass in one ear and out the other, she grabbed a hold of the word of that man of God and obeyed what he had to say. And she and her son lived through that famine and were mightily, tremendously, multiplicationally, I know that's not a word, but blessed of the Lord. Things changed. Things changed for us. I grew up in church my whole life. I know more preachers than I can shake a stick at. I've met a lot of preachers in my life. I've met a lot of religious folks in my life. I've met a lot of good Christians in my life that really love God. I've met a lot of people that are doing the best that they know how, but there came a day when I met a man of God who was different than all the others that I had been introduced to, who carried a power and anointing different from all the others that I had known my whole life. And let me tell you, I grabbed a hold of the word that God put within his mouth. There was a transition in my life there was a shift in my family and things have never, 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 never been the same again. I could no more be today who I was before I met the man of God and heard the word from his mouth. I could no more be what I was before then today as I could become a dog and walk on all fours. No, there is a word that God will give that will change your life forever. Things immediately changed. I knew I could never go back to being what I was. I was forever changed. Then came the move from Indiana to Ohio where God began to take me out of a religious mindset to a place of spiritual power. And it took some time to make that transition. I remember many sleepless nights praying in the floor struggling and praying to prevail, struggling to see, God, this is what I've been taught all my life, but now that I'm looking in your word for myself, and now that I'm hearing from the voice of a man of God, what I see and what I hear is very different from what I was taught. And that struggle ensued. But the moment I gave in to what God said, rather than what my flesh and my dead letter of the law programming taught me to believe, there was a transition in that thing that changed me and I've never been the same. Some things came over years, some things came over months, some things came overnight. Transitions occurred. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some doctrines were removed and replaced over time. Some things were done in an instant. Amen. And our life has never been the same again. I'm no more the person I was today than the preacher I started out being in 1993, I believe it was, at 17 years old when I accepted my call into the ministry and preached my first revival service and been preaching ever since. I'm no more that person today than I'll ever be. I am changed. Why? There's been a transition. Somebody say transition. 
there's been a shift. Somebody say shift. Now I thank God for that transition. <clears throat> there was another transition, another shifting that occurred, and I want to tell you about this. This gets back to the subject of my greatest fear. One Sunday morning, I woke up from what I believed was a dream. It was in Columbus, Ohio. It was a Sunday morning. I was lost in a dream, and it could have actually been a vision. There's a fine line between a dream and a vision. A dream occurs when you're asleep, and a vision is a dream that occurs when you're awake. But after it was over, I found myself staring at the ceiling, laying in the bed of my bedroom, and speaking in tongues. So I don't know if I was asleep, having a dream, or if the Holy Ghost woke me up and immediately placed me into a vision. All I know is that it was more vivid and real than reality itself. And when I awoke, I thought I was still in the dream. In this dream, I had my wife and my children with me. We were walking into this beautiful, beautiful edifice, a huge church building that sat thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. It was beautiful. We walked in and uh, tried to find a seat and the place was packed. Later on, the Holy Ghost revealed to me that that beautiful, organized, and structured church was a symbol of religion. Do you know you can have something with order and organization and it be deader than Ezekiel's bones? Yes. 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 God don't let us ever have organization without organism. You can have organization and be organized and be deader than a doornail. Amen. Amen. Or you can be alive and have absolutely no order at all and what you got then is chaos. What you need is both. You need to be alive and you need to have some order about you. You need to have both. So we were in this beautiful building, this beautiful edifice that God revealed to me was the religious church world. They had rehearsed music. It was mechanical. It was dead. It was cold. It was sounded like it was made on instruments of metal. It wasn't even pleasing to the ear. It was dry and it was dead. People were sitting in the chairs, thousands upon thousands, just a sea of people. And their faces were frozen in time. They had huge, big, fake grins on their faces and their eyes were wide open and they never blinked. They looked like zombies staring off into absolutely nothing. You know how it is when somebody daydreams? That's the way they all looked. Their eyes were wide open, great big grin on their faces and their arms and their hands moved like this, clapping with the beat of the music and they swayed back and forth and they looked dead. They looked dry. They looked like zombies. After a couple of minutes in that atmosphere, I was uncomfortable. My wife was uncomfortable. The kids were uncomfortable. Let me tell you, kids are a good discerner of spirits. Yes, they're a very good discerner of spirits. The kids were even uncomfortable. And I sat till I couldn't take anymore and I was about to leave. Just then I stood up and grabbed my wife and she grabbed the kids with her and we started down an aisle. And just then, a little old woman, she looked like Grandmother Stone, a little old woman with gray hair and a hunched over back and a little walking stick. And she had a shawl over her shoulders. I remember that in the dream. She symbolized to me the old time power of God that had been forgotten, that had gotten lost in the chaos of the crowds. She spoke up. She stood up in the aisle in front of me as I was leaving. And she spoke up and she said, what's the matter? Where are you going? And I said, I can't take this cold, dead religion. I'm serving Jesus. I want what's real. She just, little hunched old, over old woman, she just smiled at me. She didn't have any teeth. Her little wrinkled lips just let out a big smile. Like Grandmother Stone. She looked so much like Grandmother Stone. I guess that's why God used her in the dream because she was such a beautiful, holy woman. She just kind of looked up at me the best she could because her back was hunched over. She got a little gleam in her eye and just gave me a little wrinkled smile on her lips. 
And she took me by the other arm. I had Sarah and the kids on this one. She took me by this arm and we started walking out together. I had Sarah and the kids on one side and the little frail grandmother on the other side. Together we were leaving religion behind. And as we walked out the aisle, row by row, as we passed row after row after row, I could tell that others began to break their zombie-like stares. And they began to wonder what was going on. They stopped clapping like a robot. They stopped swaying back and forth. And we heard them ask, where are you going? What are you doing? And we told them, we don't want religion. We don't want religion. We don't want what's propped up and fake. We don't want any of this junk. What we want is Jesus. And we began to hear popping and cracking and all kinds of stuff. And what it was, it sounded like shattering ceramic. And what it was was their zombie-like masks that they were wearing. We began to hear them popping and cracking as they broke off their faces. Others actually reached up and took their masks off and threw them to the ground and allowed them to shatter. And as that was happening, one by one, faces became visible under those ceramic false masks of religion. And I recognized a few people. Some faces were familiar. Some faces were not. Some faces I recognized from my childhood and my days of religious denominationalism that God was setting free. Others of them I didn't recognize. They were people that I did not know at all. But as a spirit of mechanical man-made religion was being broken off of them, they began to stand up to their feet. They popped up like popcorn all over that, that huge sanctuary congregation. They began to stand to their feet. They shuffled to an aisle and there was a mass exodus out of that cold, dead religious atmosphere as people decided they didn't want religion anymore. They wanted Jesus. I awoke from that dream or vision speaking in tongues and thinking, my goodness, this was a strange experience and wondered in my spirit if the Holy Ghost wasn't speaking in tongues through me and then giving me a dream as an interpretation to the tongues that I was speaking. I don't know why that crossed my mind. I'd never given thought to that in my life. That's one of those transitions. That's one of those shiftings that occurred. So I got up, we got dressed and I went to church and I went and talked to Elder Bill Canfield. Everybody knows Brother Canfield. I love him so much. I went to Brother Canfield and I shared with him what had happened and he confirmed for me that my dream or my vision was an interpretation of the tongues that I found myself speaking in when I came to my senses and shared with me how Howard Carter, who's part of our spiritual genealogy, who God gave the greatest revelation on the nine gifts of the Spirit that the world has ever received, had recorded in his book years ago, years ago when he was a, a prisoner in a prison in England as, an, as a conscientious objector to the war. God gave him a revelation of the nine gifts of the Spirit. One of the things he penned is that a way in which a, a, a gift of tongues can be interpreted, God could interpret that through a dream or vision. He shared that with me. And I realized that that's what I found myself engaged in when I came to my senses. Amen. I shared all of that to share this with you. What if in that dream I had missed a moment of divine visitation and sat down in the crowd just like one of the rest and began to embrace and swallow hook, line, and sinker that old false doctrine of religion? If I hadn't grabbed my wife and kids up and headed for the door, the little grandmother might not have stood up, symbolic of the power of God, and said, hey, I'll go with you. I'm not here either. They got Ichabod written over the door. The Spirit of the Lord hath departed. And if I and my wife and kids and the little grandmother hadn't got up, others might not have had their masks broken off of them of religion. They might not have gotten up and followed and they'd still be in the same place today bound by religion with no hope of escape. Folks, I'm here to tell you today there is a religion of man that can bind you and hold you like a zombie. It can make you a cookie cutter Christian that obeys a denominational letter of the law and keeps you bound there for a lifetime. But let me tell you and give you good news today. 
there will come a day of visitation through which God will set free those who desire to be set free. God has sent me to this community not another community. I ask myself all the time, why God me? What, there's somebody else that could go. Why couldn't you send somebody else to this community? I wanna tell you today, hallelujah, God sent me to this community not to be a part of the religious good old boys club, to sit around chewing the fat with other preachers and talk about absolutely nothing. You know, they get frustrated with me because I don't do that at their weekly chew the fat session. I don't have time for that stuff. I don't have time for religion. I don't have time to sit around and talk and talk and talk and see nothing changed and everything stay the same that it's always been. God brought me here as the prophet Isaiah declared and as Jesus read aloud when he stood in the pulpit of the temple of Jerusalem. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are pre, uh, bruised, and to preach the acceptable gear of the Lord. In other words, as Jesus was declaring, there was a transition that was occurring. There was a shift in the order of things. I've come to this community not to live by the religious mindset of those who have come before me, but to declare freedom from religion. Amen. 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 Deliverance from the enemy and victory over the fallen foe of Christ. Do I have a witness here today? I've come to pull the mask of religion off of those who are bound. I've come to preach the gospel to the poor. What's that? That you don't have to be poor anymore. I dare you to find another preacher in this community that preaches tithing and giving and sowing and reaping in the same manner in which I do, and I guarantee you're not gonna find one. Amen. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. I've come to release those who are captive. I've come to bring sight to the physical and the spiritually blind. I've come to preach that this is the acceptable time of transition in the Lord where everything changes for the better and everything changes forever. Somebody say amen. amen. I've come to shatter the bondage of the enemy. I've come to break the back of Jezebel. I've come to break the back of Ahab. I've come to break the back of demonic possession and oppression. I've come to start a revolution. I've come to incite a riot. What's a riot? R-I-O-T? A righteous invasion of truth. I've come to stir things up in the kingdom of God. Things aren't going to be the same when I get done and things aren't going to be the same when you get done. Amen. I've come to awaken the church and lead the people of God from a religion of defeat into freedom and victory through the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah with me this morning. My greatest fear this morning is that we will remain comfortable where we are in God and we don't press forward for anything else. My fear is that instead of breaking the mask of religious bondage, we opt to wear it instead. My greatest fear is that we will miss the day of his visitation. My fear is that too many are perfectly content with leaving things as they've always been and won't fight to step out of an existence they've, all, existence they've always known and press forward to a future that they never dreamed could be possible. But I'm here to tell you today, we are in a time of transition. We are in a season of shifting. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 12 says that from the days of John the Baptist until now, you don't have to turn there. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent, what? Take it by force. But what did that say? From the time of John the Baptist until now, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom has suffered violence and the violence take it by force. In other words, when John the Baptist stepped on the scene and began to declare repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there was a shifting going on. There was a shifting going on from uh, sacrificing animals in the temple to sacrificing your heart in service to the Lord. 
there was a shifting from obeying a dead letter of the law to repenting of your sins for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. There was a time of transition. There was violence going on in the kingdom. Why? Because for 4,000 years before John the Baptist, things were not progressing as they had in the two and a half years since John the Baptist showed up. It was a time of transition. It was a time of shifting. So I want to encourage you today. You are standing in this very moment at the time which God has assigned and appointed for your life to change and never be the same again. People fear change sometimes because they get comfortable and familiar. Now, I understand, you know, I understand familiarity. I understand comfortableness. I understand wanting to feel secure. But let me tell you, in the things of God and in the ways of God, you cannot afford to grow comfortable and to grow stale and to grow relaxed. You must embrace the seasons of transition and the seasons of change. Otherwise, you won't see the miracle working power of God in your life. Things may have been the way they are your whole life, but I'm here to give you good gospel news that in a moment, in a single space of time, there can be a transition that will change your life forever. I'm talking about a transition in your home. I'm talking about a transition in your family. Yeah, but you don't know, Pastor. My kids have always been rebellious and I thought I taught them right, but they've always walked the other way. Look, either you're gonna have faith to believe God can change that or you won't. And Sister Pam, there is a difference, isn't there, in knowing and believing. Oh, come on. You can know what the word of God says. You can know it till the cows come home. But until you choose to believe what you know, there won't be anything happening in what you know. There's a shift. There's a transition that's beginning to occur. And I believe your life's gonna be changed forever for the better. Your family's gonna be changed forever for the better. Your finances can be changed forever for the better. Come on now, grasp what I'm saying. Your finances can change forever. I'm not talking about a miracle come in the mail tomorrow that gets you out of the mess you're in, but then you go back living paycheck to paycheck on the ends of the rope again for the rest of your life. God's not satisfied with giving you a once in a while blessing. He wants to change some things forever. You living on tuna fish and white bread, God wants to change that forever. Amen. Hello, Amen. hello. I'm talking a change, a transition, a transition in your finances, transition in your family, a transition in your home. There does come a moment in time. What is that moment in time? When he visits you, when he gives you a divine visitation, when he speaks a word that doesn't make sense to your mind and you just obey that word, all of a sudden everything changes for the better.